Uh, we have four people with some great experiences on this issue of uh, housing and homelessness that we want to bring out here so that they can share their views with you. We want to have a bit of a discussion about this. So uh, why don't we bring them out and let's get started. They are in order. Brenda Orchard, who's the Chief Administrative Officer for the County of Lennox and Addington. Brian Marks, Chief Administrative Officer of the Cochrane District Social Services Administration Board. Justin Marchand, Chief Executive Officer of Ontario Aboriginal Housing Services. And Marilyn Struthers, who's a facilitator with the Institute of South Georgian Bay, a community development and social innovation expert. Another round of applause, why not? Here we go. Hi, everybody. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's, um, let's start with this. I know everybody who, is in, who lives in this city that we're all in right now uh, think they have the market cornered when it comes to issues of housing affordability because the numbers are stratospheric. It's a million and a half bucks to buy a house here in Toronto on average. I want to get a better understanding of what housing affordability looks like in your neck of the province. You want to start us off? What does it look like to you? Housing affordability to us is that our own residents can afford to buy a home, their children can afford to buy a home. I mean, we've seen an influx of residents from the city coming to our area to live, and that's wonderful. We welcome them, we need their employment, we need the labor for sure. But with that, the prices have risen incredibly. Some of our counties in eastern Ontario have seen an 80% increase in housing prices. It's, that's astonishing and our own local people then can't afford to buy. And it's very concerning for, for everybody here, for sure. Brian, how does it look to you? Well, I mean, the, the housing affordability is relative. In Northern Ontario, things just cost more. Uh, so it, it causes people to stretch their dollars. Uh, however, I would say also, relatively speaking, our housing is more affordable. So please take a look at housing in Northern Ontario. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good option. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the model of housing that was built in Northern Ontario, the average age is 50, 60 years old. It was built by mines, forestry, uh, the rail sector, and it's the least adaptable model of housing. Um, single detached, uh, you know, they got their, their lot with their, their grass to cut. Um, and so it's very difficult to not only access additional service land in municipalities to develop affordable housing, uh, but it's difficult to convert the existing housing into affordable housing. So there's a crunch for sure. Uh, and with the recent influx of new Canadians through post-secondary education, um, uh, it really is stretching the housing continuum to a, a breaking point across all of our municipalities. Because hmm. the post-secondary is doing a great job bringing people in for education. The problem is there was no consideration for housing as part of that strategy. So this is something we absolutely need to get in front of so that we can free up housing for every level of the spectrum, whether it's seniors, low income, executive, healthcare professionals, you name it. Got it. Justin, in your world, what does it look like? Yeah, for sure. We, uh, we operate right across the province, so we do have that provincial view. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, we're all in this mess now together. Uh, you know, I, a housing crisis has been at the center of our Indigenous communities for a lot longer than the last decade. Uh, so that's the unfortunate part. It's also unfortunate that the rest of Canada is now facing a housing crisis. If, if it's not yourself, it's somebody that you know. It's a family member, it's a friend. Uh, but fortunately, and we saw that from the remarks yesterday, the, the questions from, from our audience members to ministers, that, that housing is now the front page of news media almost every day. And so that's the fortunate part that we're talking about it, uh, but we've still yet to, to see the action that we really need to solve, to solve this issue. We'll get into that as we continue our discussion. Marilyn, how about in your neck of the woods? Yeah, so our, our project takes place kind of between Collingwood, Nolan Sound. There are six municipalities that have been working collaboratively on really trying to get a handle on how we finance coming out of the pandemic. And, we were just thinking we kind of had a handle on that and people said, wait a minute, we have to talk about housing. Hmm. And so in, in our communities, I think we're recognizing this is really a shift time for municipalities. It's a shift time for Ontario. There are lots of changes happening and they are cascading into smaller communities like ours. So that the housing problem that we kind of already had pre-pandemic is now exasperated by um, exacerbated, <laughs> it's exasperating, but it is exacerbated, <laughs> by, 
by the pandemic where we saw a great immigration from Toronto. So we're pretty close to Toronto. So our housing prices went through the, the sky as people discovered our green lands and um, relatively low housing to purchase costs. Can you give us a sense of that? It went from what to what? On oh, average. Gosh, I can just tell you about my little home, which is not right in one of the hot spots. Typical three bedroom family bungalow sits on three acres. Our uh, housing maybe went from 400,000, probably now to worth close to a million. It's hard to tell. We don't sell, so we're, hmm. we're going to ride, we're ride it out. But it, that's what I mean by a cascade of, of things. And of course, climate change and you know, the, the new bills that have come from the province to help um, with density, those things all compound. So what's happening in our community is that people um, have taken advantage of the formerly lower prices, still relatively low prices, and bought as investments. So we have lots of second homes, which we've always had. But we have a lot of Airbnbs. So Own Sound, just for an example, one quarter of the houses in Own Sound are not owned by the people who live in them. So it's quite a change in the texture of community. And we've never had enough rental because housing wasn't expensive. So now the core, the folks that drive our economies, PSWs, uh, retail, um, those sort of three lower level sectors, tourism and hospitality, mm -hmm. Those folks are priced out of the rental market altogether. Yeah. Brenda, do I have this right? You had a housing summit six, seven months ago in your part of the province? Yes. What came out of that? Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus. I'm sure there's some members here today. We organized a housing summit. So we brought together CAOs, directors of social services, housing managers, <coughs> planners from the upper and the lower tier, and economic development staff from the upper and lower tier, which was really valuable because some of our like the grassroots ground level zoning and planning issues are lower tier, but our housing managers are at the upper tier. So not only is it a different department, it's at a different level of our local government. And it was the first time to bring them all together to talk about this issue. We talked about it for the whole day. We did some strategic planning. We wanted to come up with some action plans of things we could do to help ourselves and things we could ask from government uh, to help with. It's always good to come together and share experiences and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But do you think anything truly concrete came out of it that will improve the situation? Well, some of the things that have come out of it, and I don't know if Jim Pine's in the audience, but he's the CAO taking the lead on this. We talked about, um, and it's something on a small scale that anybody could do in your communities, but if you're in a county looking to build, say, a 30-unit building, you might want to check with a couple of your neighboring counties. Maybe you could join together to share the architectural costs and staff expertise and bundle the project phase it and go to tender so that you have bigger economies of scale, you'll attract a developer in maybe better and more developers that bid on it, better pricing. So that is that conversation during that day morphed into the big idea that EOWC is, is promoting to government, which is seven and seven. The idea of building 7,000 units within seven years in Eastern Ontario. But it came from that kernel of the idea of if a few of us got together and joined together and phased it, so I get mine one year, you get it the next, and someone else gets it the next, maybe we'd get better pricing from a developer. No different than what we do with our roads projects sometimes. But that blossomed into this bigger idea of seven and seven. And there's, there's a bunch of other ideas we've come up with of things we want to do, like one that I've just done in, in our county, which was we want our not-for-profits to be strong and resilient so that if you do have a project coming up in the future that you want a not-for-profit to support, that they're strong and resilient enough that they can participate in it. So we've brought our, in my county, brought our not-for-profits together to say, A, we appreciate you, value you, and thank you, um, and that we want you to be strong and resilient, and what are your challenges, and how can we help? And I told, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I told them that I was coming here today to talk to elected officials and senior staff, and they sent me here with a message for everybody. So the message from the not-for-profits in my county is please ask the provincial government to really do something more meaningful with mental health and addiction supports. Because, please. Um, we've seen how great the province, can, well, great, how fast the province can act and with fervor with what they've done with the planning side of, 
of housing with Bill 23 and Bill 3. I mean, they've acted quickly and, and boldly, and they've acted. Whether we like the actions or not, it's a different matter. Won't get into that. But we need that same passion and drive and fervor for them to act on mental health and addictions. Yeah. That, that issue certainly came up yesterday during the time when all the cabinet ministers were here and we had the bear pit session. That was a huge issue that emerged from that, so thank yeah. you for highlighting it's, it again. If I can just say, it's not just the people issue part of that. There's a financial issue, too. I have a, we're in, I'm in a smaller county, about 40,000 people. We spend over half a million dollars a year refurbishing social housing units that have been basically trashed because of tenants with mental health and addictions issues. That's half a million dollars that we could have put into housing projects that we're putting in just to stay, and that's just my county. I would shudder to think if we all added it up, what that cost would be across the province, not to mention the cost to OPP and labor costs and every other issue. So there's a financial piece to that as well as the human piece, which we of course care about. Right, Brian, you wanted to jump in on this? Yeah, just to mention that that's a great example of, of uh, local municipal mobilization to address an issue. And I can't let that go without um, pointing out that it's critical that uh, municipalities coordinate, whether it's upper tier, single tier, DSABs, um, to take action while we lobby the province and the feds. Because while we lobby in the feds, people continue to suffer on our streets tonight. So um, while it's not popular to, um, because some would see it as an abdication of the responsibility of the province and the feds if we do take action. But the fact is, while we wait, we have to take action on our streets. And then not only that, we have to, we have to continue that beyond a four-year election cycle. So for everybody in here who sits on an upper tier or a county or a DSAB, I mean, you wear a number of hats, whether it's with public health, your local hospital, your council, your social service board, you have to connect the dots in the moment, in the meeting. Because if we're gonna be serious about ending homelessness in our municipalities, you have the control today. You have to leverage what you have today. And, and the priorities are not exclusive. The priorities of a DSAB are not exclusive from the priorities of a public health unit. It's the same. When we talk about ending mental health or, or solving mental health or addictions mm -hmm. challenges or implementing strategies so that we're not all forced to open safe injection sites, those are, those are concurrent priorities. And they will solve multiple problems at the same time. So I would just suggest that while we all acknowledge the feds have the resources and the province have the jurisdiction and municipalities have the problem, those who have the problem need to act today while we hold the others accountable. Justin, you want to go on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, two points, one on a local level and then, and then uh, international. Um, exactly to, to Brian's point, um, before supportive housing was um, sort of the buzzword, um, we partnered with the municipality of Sioux Lookout, Northwestern Ontario. Um, initially, there was some hesitation in the community about what it was we were trying to do. Uh, we worked with the local service manager, the DSAB there, and the, and the town. Um, in terms of individuals experiencing homelessness, I'm sure many have heard, heard the stats or the costs. Um, you're spending anywhere from 90 to $200,000 per person per year that's on the street. Or you can spend a third of that, a quarter of that, possibly even a tenth of that on providing the basic needs of an individual. We went from having a little bit of pushback in that town to three months after we were opened. The OPP, the superintendent of Northwestern Ontario was calling us, telling us that calls were down 90%, that ambulances weren't going to the hospital with people who needed a prescription for housing. Um, and then we had the local taxpayers federation saying, you guys are saving us money on OPP and ambulance billbacks. So we know this works. You either, you either invest in preventative me measures or you pay a whole lot more in reactive measures. So that's one from a, from a local perspective. Um, second, second from an international perspective, and I have no connection to Scotiabank here, but if you, if you have the time, read the report they released last week they're calling, this is a big five bank, calling on Canada to double the amount of social housing that we have in this country. We are presently at half the level of social housing as our other G7 counterparts. 
Scotiabank is now saying, and this is where it's more, more powerful, right? Where, where everyone in this room knows that housing is, is the solution to homelessness. Housing is the solution to, to getting people off of the street. Now when we have a big five bank in Canada, economists saying it is much cheaper for governments in the long run to invest in housing because they're saying, which we know, market, market economics 101, supply and demand, it does not provide, markets do not provide housing for everyone. It provides housing for those who are willing and, willing and able to, uh, to pay that price. But it invariably leads to, quote, market failures, textbook term. That means that not everyone will be served by the market. Scotiabank is saying it's cheaper for governments to invest in social housing than not over the long run. So we need to make those partnerships with, with people that, and organizations that maybe we haven't in the past. But so when you get this sort of, you know, this push at the municipal level saying we need to, we need to invest better, we need to be proactive in our investments, we need to take care of people first and foremost, and then to, to Brenda's point about the financial side, when you get Bay Street economists saying, housing makes sense, do it. Why aren't we doing it? Let's do it. There's your consensus. Let's, uh, <laughs> Marilyn, I am told that uh, municipalities in the province of Ontario have a lot more responsibilities and carriage of the housing issue than, say, other municipalities in other provinces in Canada. And I guess I want to know from you if that's a blessing or a curse. <laughs> Uh, to me, anything that devolves power and control down to a community is a blessing. But that said, I mean, there's lots been spoken to about the, the need for partnerships across different levels of government. And what I wa really want to say in response to my colleagues um, is that the financialization of housing in Canada is a system. We have a system of, of how you own a home and whether you can rent, rent a home, um, whether in fact, you're in social housing. That's a financial system. And when you look for innovation at a systems level, I know when our, our group, as the collaborative group of municipal councillors and housing advocates <clears throat> and uh, nonprofits and business, people said, when do we put the shovel in the ground? Let's get the shovel in the ground. And in innovation process, it's about stopping and understanding what the interventions are in the system that makes the difference. So we have in, in Ontario, speak just in Ontario, a system that create, it's de is designed to create exactly the results we've got. It can't do anything else. It has, it has produced what we built that system to do. And it has failed. It has failed. And the fallout from that failure will be enormously felt at the community level. And so it's really interesting, you know, in our work we found it just fascinating to think, what is the leverage of a municipality? How do we bring collaboration to bear municipality by municipality and between municipalities as well as across other levels of government? Because that's where we, we, that's where we live and that's where the fallout is. Brian, can I check that line with you? We have a system that has failed. Do you agree with that? I would agree with that, um, especially if we focus on, on the, just the capital side alone. Um, and for the points I made earlier, across much of rural Ontario, housing was built um, based on a, a, an ideology. Like uh, we had uh, you know, heavy immigration in, in the mid-1900s, uh, mid-1900s. And it was a, a goal of people to own their plot of land, single detached home, be able to cut their grass, suburbs expanded. Um, and that system no longer is what is required in, in Ontario at large. And it's very difficult to work within that. I mean, we've seen the initiatives recently, right, about secondary suites, zoning changes. I mean, you gotta wonder what that looks like five, 10 years from now when we, we build that capacity inside our existing system. So I, I would agree with that. And I'd extend the point to say that when we're talking about homelessness, there's a part of the system that we don't acknowledge, and that is, uh, to Brenda's point, about the supports that have to be in place. And it's difficult across all of Northern Ontario to deliver those supports through a system that's already struggling through capacity problems. Can I follow up on that? There, there, are, there are people in, in the South here who, on a routine basis, stumble across homeless people in their daily lives. You can walk outside this very hotel 
and run into it. And it's, well, I hope it's still considered shocking for people to see this. I'd hate for people to be inured by this. But people down south may not think that that, that kind of homelessness exists in the north. Does it? It didn't. And uh, within the last 10 years, we never thought on the streets of Hearst or Timmins that we would see people on the streets at minus 30 degrees. But it is happening. It is happening tonight. Uh, and the emergency shelters that we've put in place um, don't have the capacity to deal with it. And an emergency shelter is no kind of solution. I mean, it's a solution to save somebody's life tonight if they choose to stay in the shelter. But, I mean, most of rural Ontario is not equipped, even though we received some modest funding from the province to be able to deliver emergency supports, that's not the kind of support that's going to end homelessness. And until, I say this uh, uh, with some experience, until ending homelessness becomes a priority for education, health care, solicitor general, we will be chasing it. 99%, if not 100% of our homelessness strategies are reactive. It's to what's happening on the street tonight. No one is thinking about early childhood education, uh, parenting programs, nutrition programs, um, what to do to keep uh, the youth that are in First Nations um, from becoming addicted and then on the streets in, in our municipalities. So, I mean, I, at the risk of taking up the next 38 minutes, I mean, I could talk about <laughs> what needs to happen in the relationship between First Nations and municipalities and, and how the province and the feds continue to block that relationship. It really Maybe is another time. <laughs> well, it's, it sounds it really is a case of you know you pay me now or you can pay me later. Right. And if you pay me later, you're going to pay a lot more. In Lennox and Addington, do you have a homelessness problem? Absolutely, absolutely. All of our rural areas do. What does it look like? It looks in some of the more I'll say urban, like in the town setting. There we have a shelter in Napanee, for example, um, Morning Star Mission. They're doing a great job. It's sort of a warming center, but now it's become more of a shelter. Um, but there's a lot of folks that are just sleeping couch to couch or staying in abusive relationships because they have no place to go or undesirable situations because they have no choices. And I worry that it exacerbates their addiction issues because for some of them, showing up with a bottle of booze is their way they get to sleep on somebody's couch. You know, like it's, it's, it's in cycle. You need housing to support mental health and addictions supports, but you need mental health and addiction supports so that someone can maintain their housing so that they don't get evicted. I, I worry that some communities think and some residents think, oh, a shelter, that's going to solve everything. Shelter's not going to solve much of anything because it, the very conditions that make you homeless in the first place, the mental health and addictions issues that make you homeless, are the same conditions that prevent you from even entering a shelter. Like, for example, you can't take drugs into a shelter, and if you're not willing to part with your drugs at the door, you don't want to walk through the door. Mm -hmm. Or if your mental health conditions require, like, you have a machete or a club and it goes wherever you go, you can't bring a weapon into the shelter. Those people are still on the street, and then our taxpayers say, oh, you're not doing enough, they're still homeless on the street, the shelter must be, you know, overcrowded. Well, no, it's just those people can't see themselves to get through that door. We need to provide the support so that they can support them so that they can then access the supports that we want to provide. Brian, quick follow on that? Yeah, uh, I was just gonna say that <clears throat> it's important for everybody to understand that um, we're not just talking about your mental health and addiction supports and the visits that happen once or twice a week. People need relationships. And what we found after, in the first year of the pandemic, we housed 50 people in 90 days. Uh, through a partnership with Northern College, uh, we accessed their residence, and then we were able to house them from a stable platform. A good 50% of those people returned to homelessness because they were alone in their new home, and they were away from the network that they had created while they were on the street or in the emergency shelter. Just like any of us would need a network when we move to a new town. Moving is one of the top, uh, always rated at the top, right behind uh, death of a family member, change in career. Moving is right there at the top for all of us when it comes to stress. It's the same thing for a homeless person. When you take them out of their environment, they need supports continuously to get to a certain point. So I think we need to acknowledge that there, there's more of a support system that needs to be created so that people not only retain housing, but can move to a new level of housing. Justin, you wanted to add? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Homelessness presents itself in, in so many other areas. In the emergency room of the hospital, how many questions did we hear yesterday about we need more support for our hospitals in the rural areas? Somebody going to the hospital because they're homeless, so what, we're going to spend six, seven, eight hundred dollars on a doctor's visit, two hundred dollars on an ambulance visit per day every time they go because guess what, it's cold in northern Ontario in the middle of winter. It presents itself in a person who breaks a window in January at a corner store, not to hurt anyone, but just so I can get three square meals and a roof over my head in the local jail. Um, it's just there are, there are, there's just so much better that we, that we can do. Um, tagging on to Brian's point about support, this is why our organization is, has proven that Indigenous-led solutions matter because community matters. There was just a doctor last week who, who was talking about the impact of, of loneliness is actually more harmful than smoking 50 cigarettes a day. I saw that. Yeah. And so um, when we take those different approaches to homelessness, which by the way, indigenous people living in urban and rural areas are 11 times more likely to experience homelessness than, than other uh, Canadians, um, it means we need to do something different, clearly different. Um, as Marilyn said, the, the system that we have right now is perfectly designed to get the results that we have, and part of those results include, uh, include the exclusion of Indigenous people in, in this society, and that needs to absolutely change. Mar <laughs> I'm told 25 to 50 percent of the people who are homeless have some kind of mental health issue in their lives right now. And I wonder how you feel that ought to, that fact ought to influence decision makers when they presumably make good decisions to help this situation. So I want to reframe that just a little bit in terms of a failed system. So what we're seeing are homeless people are the people who have dropped out of the system that has been, they're at the bottom. They have failed, fallen out of a failed system. But there's something wrong with the system all the way up. There's something wrong with the system where kids like mine, I have grandkids who are in the uh, construction and um, retail industry heading in to be a PSW, we'll see how that goes. Those kids are in precarious housing. They are one rent eviction away from my basement. They're not homeless now. They're, they're a nice little family, they're safely housed, but precarity has to be taken into account when we think about mental health. Yeah. If we sort of ladder the system a little bit, we've got people who are profiting enormously from the system that we have. And these folks are owning more than one home. These folks are able to rent those homes uh, at Airbnb and verbal rates. And that drives the price of, of housing up even further. So I think when we think about the impact of mental health, being safely housed, but also having autonomy to be able to live your life in a way that fits with some financial security. Most of the mental health connected to poverty literature that I've had the chance to read talks about the poverty deficit, how much of your mental energy it takes to live on very little. And I tell you, in my small town, if you're uh, right now working in retail and you begin to look for a one bedroom apartment, it's gonna cost you something like, if you got lucky, $1,900 a month, probably more like 23. And you multiply that out for 30% of affordability, that's our standard Canadian definition, 30% of, of, of your housing costs, including your rent, your, you know, um, transportation, electricity, heat, has got to come out of, your, of a family income, a household income. And there's lots of people that can't do that. So when you lose that security, the tumble down into mental health and addictions is inevitable. And if as, as communities and societies, we can't ignore what's happening down there, we have to provide those services. But if we just do that, and we don't pay attention to what's creating the, the fall, we're upholding the system. It's just, sure, applause, applause. 
it's just occurred to me, it looks like I'm hoarding all the water here. So, <laughs> and I don't want to do that. And you, if you are parched, maybe uh, Marilyn, you can just pass some of these down here so that uh, everybody can wet, wet their whistle a little bit. Okay. Uh, we're talking housing and homelessness at the Roma Conference. We're on TVO tonight. We have four guests from across the province of Ontario who are bringing their experiences to bear in this most timely and important conversation. Brian, maybe you could pick up with this. Is addiction a cause or a consequence of homelessness? Oh. <laughs> You're talking to a guy who has uh, told um, uh, countless political decision makers that you cannot associate addictions and mental health with homelessness, um, even though they are associated. If you, if you characterize homelessness through those lenses, you cannot focus on the solutions that are required on each individual to end their homelessness. We think, we think of homelessness at a systems level, and everyone sees this convoluted problem with it, it, that's impossible to solve. And you need to break it down. Everyone's got a story. Everyone, you need to know that story. I would say, like any of us who are in a position of stress, sometimes we will look for an escape. And so if that manifests in alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, I'm not going to say it's a coincidence because people who are homeless, homeless spend 99% of their day in, in moments of stress, trying to figure out their security, their safety, um, where they're going to get their next hit. So uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say it's a cause or a result. The fact is that the vast majority of people who suffer from addictions are not homeless. So is that a cause or a result of them not being homeless? I don't think you can attribute it to that. Um, but to my, the point I made earlier, uh, until ending homelessness becomes a priority for health care, um, we will continue to see uh, addictions manifest itself largely in that population. Brendan, let's talk social housing. Am I right? You've got 450 social housing yes. units? How expensive is it to maintain that infrastructure? It's very expensive. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but the, just the refurbishments of the units that are vacated is over half a million a year, which I think would surprise probably my councillors here today and the, and the taxpayers in our county. Does the but, property tax base, is it able to keep that housing stock in top shape? Yes. I mean, we, we strive to. We're proud of the services that we provide. We're proud of our buildings and the quantity. Of course, we want to do more. We aspire to do more. We recently partnered with our township of Stone Mills. Uh, they provided us two pieces of land for free, and we put up two four units. Now, I know in an urban setting, eight units doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in a small community like Tamworth, Ontario, uh, eight units is great. And they're on well and septic. There's no services there, so we need more of that. We need more of the rural, truly rural solutions, because I'll tap onto something that was said earlier, that we have to help people be successful in their own communities. I don't know if anyone's familiar with familiar with Bridges Out of Poverty, but it talks about how we help elevate people out of poverty. And it speaks to the fact that interpersonal connections and relationships are the most important thing to people living in poverty. And how do we expect people to move to a city or move to a new community to try to be successful? It, their connections are with the people in their communities, and we have to find a way to get on the radar screen of the province and CMHC and funding agencies. Frankly, if you're in Ontario and your population is under 100,000 and you're looking for CMHC funding for housing, I wish you the best of luck. Can't be done? I, I don't think we're on the radar screen. I think they think they can, you know, you want those big numbers like the 1.5 million and you can get them faster by focusing on urban, you know, your, your percentage wise, you know. But rural is important too and we need those rural solutions. If we want people to be able to pull themselves up from the bootstraps and stabilize their lives, we need to provide them solutions in their own communities. Marilyn, you want to jump in? Yeah. What does it mean if the answer to the crisis we're in now is more subsidized housing? What does it mean? How much subsidized housing is enough? Mm -hmm. What people need is affordable housing that fits with the employment opportunities that are available in the community. And I think this is where municipal um, decision making around development becomes so important. I am not sure, 
and if there is, I'd love to hear, if there's a municipality that knows how many units at what affordability would be a good deal for their community given the key employment opportunities that are there. It's part of what's come out of what we've been thinking about this big year-long think across six municipalities is that we don't actually have the very local data to be able to make those decisions at a development level to really exploit what the powers of a municipality may be. So we call that the affordability matrix, and at the moment we're searching for, we may have one, but we're searching for a community that can work out the data profile that could begin to give us that kind of data. If we've got a broken system, the answer cannot be building eternally subsidized housing at the bottom to catch the, catch the outfall. It has to be a solution right now, but if that's not a system solution, that's a Band-Aid solution. How do, how do we get to a system provocative. solution? You want to pick up on that? Then maybe we'll hear yeah. from others on that. Um, I wish I had the magic bullet, but after a year of thinking, <laughs> we're launching a toolkit next week. I'll just give this little plug. Of uh, We had a chance to, in our communities, both be part of uh, three UN Habitat in Small Communities uh, conferences, global conferences, so we had a chance to listen in on a lot of good thinking, and we also had the chance to join um, a CMHC Social Innovation Canada Social Innovation Lab. Uh, we spent about a year at this in conversation with others across Canada who are trying to figure out what the innovation is that shifts the, the financialization of housing system that we have. So that'll all, that sort of deep thinking will be available. I can't say that we know exactly what to do, but one of the key tenets that we've been playing with is if the market doesn't work for us anymore, if the market is not providing the kind of housing that we need, if it's unrealistic to actually subsidize the amount of housing that we need, what are the op other opportunities? So we've, we've been looking at social finance, um, which is a growing field in Canada. It's about 20 years old now. Tabs into something called community wealth. How does that work? And how it works is, right now I know to buy local. I can support my community if I buy local. But what if I could spend, lend, or invest local for the benefit of my community? Hmm. And what if every councillor in this room were working with your municipalities on social procurement, on creating a social bond or a community bond, social bond in Toronto to support housing specifically? There's a slew of new mechanisms that are being used in urban that we haven't cottoned on to much in rural. And if we did, if, if any of you do have, I'd love to talk to you. That's the conversation I think we need to expand. If the market doesn't work, then we have to turn to see how community can work. And in urban, last point, urban nonprofit sector has taken up a lot of that discovery and um, the YWCA here in the Toronto, in Toronto, I don't know how many, 190 units of uh, supportive housing for women they've developed through community bond processes and stacking and leveraging processes. We don't, we don't have the density of nonprofit sector in rural. Our largest financial stakeholders are our municipalities. So we need our municipalities to be in on this and then also help to get our key institutions like schools and um, uh, hospitals, healthcare institutions in on it. Brian, we know, we know we're in the soup. What's the yeah. way out? Well, just uh, uh, to those points, uh, absolutely low-hanging fruit that can be solved is to marry your housing strategies locally with economic development uh, and planning. It's easier at a single tier, difficult at county and upper tier and DSAB levels, but it's doable and it should be done. And, and every service manager in the province writes a 10-year housing and homelessness plan, and that should be in included. That said, to create affordability, it used to be possible until interest rates tripled overnight. Now, with interest rates where they are, um, and I should preface this by saying, uh, no housing should have to be supported on the property tax base. That's just not, it's a dying model. For much of Northern Ontario, we've had consistent population out migration and property tax bases are dwindling. 
you cannot, we're having a hard time supporting uh, the infrastructure that we inherited in the late 90s with local service realignment. So the alternative must be what? Well, uh, we absolutely need funding from both levels of senior government. I mean, it has to come in now more than ever because we can't do it. We used to be able to do it when interest rates were 2%. Uh, but that said, it was challenging considering the population that we were trying to serve as well. Ontario Works and ODSP rates are not anywhere near they need to be for people to be able to live in an affordable unit. Minimum wage is nowhere near where it needs to be. We actually have to be honest about living wage conversations in each municipality so that people can live affordably in our municipalities based on the housing that we can provide. Okay. Justin, uh, let me put this to you. There's a report by the Northern Institute that says the rate of homelessness per thousand people is often two or three times higher in northern municipalities than say in the big cities of Toronto or Ottawa. The numbers obviously are bigger down here, but the rates are bigger in the north. And, uh, and I don't have to tell you, particularly among indigenous people. Do you think the decision makers get that? Um, I think people are starting to understand this, um, but we still haven't made those explicit policy choices that to get out of this mess. So we got here because of, because of policy choices. Homelessness, homelessness at a societal level, I'm talking an individual level. Homelessness at a societal level is a choice of society. It, it simply is. There are countries, you look at Finland, Finland made a choice to eliminate homelessness. The graph on homelessness looks like this in Finland. That's because they said, Enough is enough. We're better, we're better as a society than, than what we have right now. And it absolutely is a choice amongst municipal, provincial, and federal governments, whether we continue the status quo or, or whether we do something different. And deciding to do nothing is your vote for the status quo. It, it needs to be, we need to make those explicit policy choices. And to be quite frank, I'm a CPA. This does require resources. This, this does require resources. People were excluded from participating in economy. People were traumatized because of policy choices that governments have made. And it's going to take explicit resources now, to your point earlier, Steve, pay me now or pay me later. It is now, now it's time to pay later because of choices that were made in the past. But there are choices that are being made today. And frankly, some of that has to show up on budget day. Just a quick point. Unfortunately, Cochrane DSAB leads in that category with 3.9 uh, homeless people per thousand. We lead the province. Um, and so we all know this, the capacity challenges to, to provide the supports, let alone the housing in Northern Ontario. But to Justin's point as well, um, right now the current count is 82% present as Indigenous in our municipalities. And without us getting through the jurisdictional BS between the province pointing to the Fed saying on reserve is a federal issue and the Fed's pointing to the province saying it's a healthcare issue, it's provincial, we will continue to, to chase it and not be able to solve the problems. So municipalities need to act and develop relationships with the First Nations where people come to our communities for things like healthcare, employment, education, or they're released from incarceration into our municipalities. If we want to end homelessness, we need to really get serious about truth and reconciliation at municipal and First Nations levels. Okay. Brenda, again, I'm told local volunteer and nonprofit groups have been offering support in your community. How do, how do they navigate all of these responsibilities? It's difficult. Volunteers are exhausted. In our communities, it's usually the same people that get tapped on the shoulder. They are really tired. And just one example I can give you, I won't say the community, but we have one of our not-for-profits, housing not-for-profits. Um, the board is facing a lot of pressure in that community because of mental health and addictions in the units. And it's a very small rural community. And with those addictions issues being introduced into the community, the residents are now experiencing vandalism and property crime that had not ever been there before. And it's actually turning towards the board members and the residents in the community are upset with the board members saying it's your building and you've brought this into the community. So not only are the volunteers tired, they're now sometimes feeling 
the pushback from the community instead of that thank you, we appreciate what you're doing and we value what we're do you're doing. That's not all the communities, but some of the communities that are experiencing that kind of an urban pressure that they've never felt before, that, that's a difficult adjustment. Well, the solution there presumably is is not to say we don't want any more volunteers. No. What do we do instead? Well, that's why in, in my county we're bringing the volunteers together to say how can we, thank you mm -hmm. first, and how can we help you and support you and what are your challenges? And I would encourage everybody to go back and consider doing that for your not-for-profit volunteers for sure because they're feeling the pressure. I also think it's important, I'll tag on the Maryland's comment uh, about um, looking at other solutions, either in other countries or even across our country. Like for example, in Nova Scotia, if you got your phone and you want to Google Community Economic Development Investment Funds, or CEDIF, in Nova Scotia, it's a mechanism where your community, the community can invest and get RSP deductions, like the 35%, whatever, that we're all looking for this time of year, um, and either businesses or in social housing projects. I'm not suggesting that a taxpayer would put their whole portfolio into something like that, but those of us that are socially minded might take a portion of our, our portfolio to put into that, to invest in our own communities. That's just one example of something we could do. Also interested in Winnipeg, Prosper Construction, they take marginalized people from their community, people that have just gotten out of jail or have addictions issues or they're just whatever marginalized population, and they teach them construction skills and they're actually refurbishing um, affordable housing projects. You can hire them to do the affordable housing projects. They're renovating unused buildings that can then be used for housing. So I, I just think that's fantastic. So there are some ideas out There's there. There's ideas out there all across the country. It would be great to have a repository of ideas, even if the province would do it for us in Ontario, so we could all share our good ideas and build on each other's ideas instead of like what my staff do, scavenge the internet for ideas that we can rob and <laughs> steal, rob and duplicate. Justin and then Brian. Yeah, no, we've got a, we've got a couple examples of really positive programs that, that make change. Um, you can have really no greater return on your investment than investing in, in people. Uh, people who serve people, people who like people, we, we know this. Uh, economists are also saying the same thing, but I'll give you a couple of concrete examples. One is we have an urban indigenous homeward bound program. And when I say urban, urban includes, you know, towns that have less than 5,000 people, that, that's also urban. Um, but where, where we invest in, uh, in indigenous mothers to uh, break that cycle of poverty. And the only way you're gonna break that cycle of poverty is wrapping community supports around that individual. So where you build housing with on-site childcare, you support that mother to, to go back to school um, and support for three to four years um, so that she's supported, she knows her children are safe. And then uh, we, pair, we pair those participants with a private sector uh, industry council to make sure that they're making education choices that are gonna be a result in employability um, and that they have the connections for employment when they're, when they're done their school. We've got mothers that have, that have now graduated out of that out of those programs that are uh, working in the trades, that are RPNs, that are PSWs. Um, so that's how, you, that's how you break the cycles of poverty and that's how you prevent homelessness from happening is you show those children that mom is showing those children that there's a, that there's a different way, there's a different possibility. So that's one really positive example. And then another one that we have, um, we have a we have a, and this sounds very basic, but it, it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, and there's, there's others that do this too, but where we've got a, uh, an internal maintenance program where we've got uh, qualified Red Seal trades uh, people as supervisors, we're uh, literally taking individuals off the street, um, giving them a, an income where they can support getting their own housing and where they're learning a skill. They start out with, you know, just the basics cutting the grass, cleaning the, cleaning the snow, and within six months, our folks have them installing windows and doors, uh, flooring, um, sort of basic construction, and, and we move people on the way to, uh, to self-sufficiency. And so, so it's work. that investment, that's, that's where you're gonna get that greatest return on investment, is, is, is killing poverty. Brian. Just a quick point on, on the front line part of, of your question. Um, I, I was uh, at a conference in November, and, and 
it's not unlike the points you've been making about um, you know, the units that get trashed and, and or hoarding that exists in our units. Um, uh, just for everybody here, um, don't assume there's no plan just because you don't know what the plan is yet as municipal councillors. Um, and support, and don't make assumptions, support the people that have been doing really good work in a very trying environment. Um, and the question at the, at the conference that was asked by a community member was, you know, what is the right answer when we provide a unit and it gets trashed and then the person goes back to homelessness and then we do it again and we do it again? And there were, no, the, the presenters had no answer. And, and I, I just said that at times um, you have to resign yourself to the fact that there may not be one right answer, but there is absolutely only, only one wrong answer, and that's to stop trying. Mm -hmm. That at the end of the day, you've got to keep going. And so, you know, I would just put it out there to everybody, whether you're, you know, upper tier county, single tier. I mean, you've got good people in your communities doing the good work every day. Do you think some people have stopped trying because they, they simply wash their hands of it saying, this is too complicated and we can't solve it? I got to be honest with you. I, I think like that at times. Um, when you're in a position that you have access to a considerable amount of resources, uh, to affect change, and you know things that you wish you didn't know, that, um, you know, it doesn't have to be this way today. Uh, it can get frustrating, but like I said, it, doing something other than nothing has to be at least the step in the right direction. Just a, just a quick point, too. I'd just like to put that in perspective, and this is for our organization anyways. We serve 11,000 people every day, and do we have some units that are, that are trashed? Uh, we have a few, uh, but it's really not. I, like, I don't, wanna, I don't want this to sound like it's a, it's a problem that's bigger than it is. Um, that happens in the, in the nonprofit housing sector. Guess what? It also happens in the market housing sector, too. So uh, by and large, uh, for us anyways, that's, that's, not a huge, that's not a huge issue. And I think when you, when you provide those... Uh, uh, that support, that sense of community, that goes a long way. It doesn't prevent it completely. Um, but again, I, I want to make sure that, it, that people don't perceive that as, as you know, uh, a bigger issue than what it is. Sure. Marilyn, are there days where you think, this is too big, we just can't solve it, I've had enough? <laughs> I'm a, a facilitator in training, so part of my work is to take those moments and transform them into something else. How's that going? Um, it's actually, you know, I've learned a huge amount um, as a facilitator in the work that we've done because the endless focus on um, volunteers, volunteer solutions and, you know, what do you do about the trashing, the, those, those symptoms of a community that has not served people well, that's exhausting. So one of the solutions to that, there's a couple of things I want to say. One is when you put together people from many different sectors in a room and address a complex problem, you first have to recognize there's no one solution, right? There are many, many solutions to a complex problem. There might be this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. There, there's no one, one right way. And that's often really frustrating in a community to, you know, we like, we leave the meeting tonight, we know what we're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. But maybe we don't. Maybe if you bring, the way I like to say it is that when you think together with the same people all the time, you think you have the same thoughts. When you think together across business, um, municipal councillors, staff, nonprofits, homeless people, people who are just struggling to stay in their homes, those solutions will become really different. And those are the ones that I think we need the bravery to work through the ambiguity to reach. And those conversations are energizing. They're not stuck conversations. They're energizing. Good. So As this one has been, if those. I can say. Steve. We are, Steve, yeah, sure. Could, yeah, just on, on that topic, I, I'd like to channel the, some words from, uh, from my late elder, Shirley Roach. She must have saw my brain spinning a, mi a million miles a minute. And... Um, she put her hand on, on my shoulder and she said, uh, and this is somebody that had been to uh, residential schools and in uh, a whole bunch of things that, you know, 
those policy choices that governments made. If, if it happened, it happened to, to Shirley. And she still had this smile on her face every day. She saw my brain go on a million miles a minute and she put her hand on my shoulder and she smiled and she said, Justin, she said, you know you're not gonna solve this issue. She's talking about housing and homelessness. She says, you know you're not gonna solve this issue in your lifetime, eh? And so talk about a lesson in humility, right? One of the seven grandfather teachings. And she said, but what you are gonna do is she said, you are gonna work with whoever you can to help whomever you can. That's wise, isn't it? Wow, mm -hmm. isn't that wise? Beautiful, beautiful. I'm just, I'm mindful of the clock here and I think I want to uh, finish this panel by asking each of you for 30 seconds of similar wisdom. Leave this audience with one thought that you think they can take from this room and uh, while they may not solve housing and homelessness in their lifetimes, they can move the yardsticks forward. Brenda, start us off. I think for me, it's for counties and municipalities to talk to their neighbors about the plans and things they might want to do, to look for collaboration, because in rural, we need economies of scale. If we truly want um, better pricing on contracts and things like that, we need to learn to work together better. And I say the same thing goes within your own community in terms of with your volunteers, with your councils, with your staff. So you have good people that really, really care but we have to have a dialogue with them and let them know that we appreciate what they're doing. I think there's some appreciation that needs to take place here. Brian. Act while lobbying uh, and don't stop uh, because the, the solutions that are required to end homelessness extend beyond four year election cycle. So when we're talking about upstream things, be courageous and do what needs to be done now. And then if you happen to not be elected in three years, don't stop. Stay involved, stay on the boards, continue the strategies, hold people's feet to the fire to continue what you started. Because that's what it's gonna take. And like Justin said, it's, it's gonna take a lifetime. So when's the best day to plant a tree? 20 years ago, the second best day, today. Well said. Mm -hmm. Justin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, housing, is, housing is just a tool, and I don't wanna say just in terms of minimizing it, it's absolutely, uh, physiologically needed by every single one of us. Uh, at its core, housing is about people. Um, and so, you know, my recommendation or suggestion would be to continue to develop relationships with the people in your community, including the people that you haven't met before. Um, reconciliation is at it, also at its core is about relationships. Relationships are about people. So um, work with the partners in your community, work with partners that you haven't met before, and um, start there, start with people, finish with people. Marilyn, last word to you. A failed financial system, the cure is going to be a new financial system. And we have inordinate wealth in our communities. It's just not distributed very well. And we can, if we think collaboratively with government, our own governments, nonprofits and business, we can shift that system locally, and if we connect up to the power of scale across our communities, um, we have a ton of opportunity to do things differently. I just want to say we're, our toolkit goes, goes up. If the social finance stuff sounds like Greek, um, our, our material goes up on the website next week, and I can, if you just Google the South Georgian Bay Institute, uh, probably early February, you can have access to Terrific. what we've learned, the beginning. Right? Uh, let me just say in conclusion, I've moderated a lot of discussions at conferences like this. I can't recall one where the participants were interrupted by applause as often as this one was. <laughs> I think that means, there we go again. Good job. Good job. I, I'm going to infer from that that they liked what you had to say and they liked the way you said it. Uh, I'm not sure I've met four more passionate, dedicated people who really want to, if not solve this in their lifetimes, at least make some progress. And I know this audience wants to join me in thanking the four of you for coming to Roma to have this conversation. Thank you for it very much. Oh, look at that. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.